Well, a big thank you to the uh, library. This has been so much fun to be able to share in person on Tuesdays and then on Zoom on Thursdays. So it's been a great partnership to get the word out on all the different topics about gardening. So composting and more green gardening practices. That's what we're gonna talk about tonight. But you know, there are so many things happening, not just at the library, but also at the extension service. So whether it's gardening or uh, nutrition, 4-H, all those things are available at the Sedgwick County Extension Service. It's really quite the place. Uh, it's, a, it's a happening spot. So uh, check this website out and uh, join us for the various programs that are available. Well, here's the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. You know, we, we hear the word compost or composer or whatever you've decided to call it, compost. And we need to define it because people throw that term out over and over and we want to know what do we really mean by it. Well, why would we even want compost? And if we want compost, how are we going to make more of it? And if we make more of it, how are we going to use it? And the question that I'm going to ask over and over is, aren't there some easier ways that we can do this? So as we go through the various topics, That'll be a theme that we see tonight, because if we can make it easier, then hopefully more people will be participating. So here's the definitions. Compost. Here's why it's confusing. Compost is both a verb and a noun. So it's an action and a product. Compost is the natural action of degrade, degrading of organic materials. If we didn't have degrading of organic materials, we'd be up to our ears in leaves and, and materials. So it's the normal process of nature where organic compounds degrade into smaller things. Well, the smaller things that, get it, that it degrade into is called compost. It's that earthy, dark material that's soft and fluffy. And, and it, to me, it just smells, it smells wonderful. Some people use the word humus, but I'm gonna use the word compost tonight. So it's the verb, the action of degrading, and then it's the material, the product of that degradation process. We want compost because when you put it into your soil as an amendment, it enhances the moisture, it retention, it provides nutrients to the plants. And there's even some recent literature that shows we may increase the biodiversity of the, the bacteria and fungus that are in the soil. The good things that are there helping our plants and, uh, and materials. So in the United States in 2018, we had generated nearly 3 million tons of material that went to the munis municipal solid waste. Now that's about five pounds of waste that goes to the landfill per day per person. Now, I'm gonna call your attention, this was 2018, this was pre-pandemic and I don't know about you, but I found Amazon during the pandemic. And I, things showed up at my door within four hours of me clicking a button. But when they showed up at my door, they were inside of a box, inside of another box, inside of a bunch of plastic and things. There was just a lot of waste that was created through the pandemic. And again, many of us went took food to go. So more materials were going to the landfill. I think that this five pounds per person per day is probably a way low estimate for what we have now post pandemic. Well, what does it matter if it goes to the landfill? Well, the material that goes to the landfill, it may not decompose. When you place material in the landfill, it uh, is compacted and it becomes anaerobic, meaning without air, anaerobic, 
And when materials are anaerobic, they may not decompose or they, we know they won't decompose because de decomposition is a very aerobic activity. So um, when that material gets sent there, pretty much it stays the same. It's just there for, for the life of the, the um, material. So we really want to avert things going to the uh, municipal landfill. Compost, as I said, is a very natural process, but there's some things that we can do to help. This is called the food web uh, of the compost pile. And you can see there's apples and bananas and bread and, you know, a pineapple. And then we have our gardener person coming along and they're placing their leaves and probably grass clippings, things like that. And as that material is accumulated, various little critters start to begin that composting, that action, that activity. Well, first le level consumers might be things like snails and slugs and worms and wood lice. There's also things that we can't see. Bacteria, fungi, protozoa, all those, all those uh, critters start to chew up these, this organic material to eventually make it into the product that we've talked about, which is compost. You keep going down the levels, there's mites, there's springtails, again, roundworms, centipedes, millipedes, these are the bigger chewers. And these are the things that really break the materials down so that then our little itty bitty uh, decomposers like uh, bacteria and fungi can then work on it. Let's look at each one of these layers a little bit more in depth and talk about what's going on with each of them. These slides are not in your handouts because they just didn't show up good on the handouts. So sorry about that, but follow along with me as we talk about them. The chemical processors, these are again, microbes. Our soil is loaded with microbes, bacteria, fungus, protozoa. And this set of microbes release chemicals. And these chemicals, well, you know, it's kind of like when you start to chew your food. When you place a bite of food in your mouth and you start to chew it up, the saliva is excreted. And saliva begins the chemical process of your food becoming uh, absorbable. So you don't like to think about food decomposing, but you are, you are utilizing that food into it in a different method. So these chemical composters uh, excrete, a, excrete the chemicals that begin that breakdown of the, of the organic matter. If you've ever uh, raked up some old leaves and maybe you saw a bunch of white threads throughout those old leaves, those threads are not cotton candy. Those, those threads are fungus. So it's called the micro, mycorrhizal network. And it's millions of little fungus that are not visible to the eye coming together in strands that then begin to break down that organic matter. Well, these release chemicals, but there's also some um, microbes that are biological regulators and they do a little bit of chewing so they may actually degrade the materials but they also have a role in regulating good and bad bacteria in the compost pile so you might have a nematode that kills off a pathogenic bacteria or a protozoa that regulates what kind of bacteria we have. But these things are working more on the biological level. These are all things we can't see, but let's talk about the things that we can see. These are those ecosystem engineers. These are the chewers. These are the things that when you turn your compost pile or when you open your compost pile and look at it, you can actually see little things moving in your compost pile. It might be something as common as an earthworm or a centipede or that lowly little roly poly, that, that pill bug. Those things have a huge um, 
impact on chewing up our organic matter and turning it into the usable product compost. Well, let's look at this in action. This is a time lapsed uh, video. And on the left hand side, we just have those microscopic products. And in each side, we have leaves. Left side, only microbes. The right side has microbes plus those ecosystem engineers. You can see every now and then a worm or maybe a beetle or a centipede. And this is a 15 week time lapse of just leaves being degraded. And when you see the right side, you realize the impact that those, those ecosystem engineers have by chewing up that material and making it smaller. Those microbes can then attack it and, and again, help to degrade and eventually become that dark earthy material. In a 15 week time frame, microbes did a lot, but look at the combination, the synergy of the microbes plus the, uh, the, the ecosystem engineers, the chewers, the worms, the beetles, the sow bugs. This is getting close to what we would call compost. There's still a lot of leftover organic material that can decompose, but that's that beautiful earthy brown material that we talk about. Well, how can we help this composting activity occur. Um, this is compost bins can be just about anything, compost containers. It can be a bin, a tumbler, a pit, a pile, or literally just about anything. Let's take a look at some of these uh, components. I've got, I've sent this reference. It's in your handout. Uh, it's also at our, um, in our reference guide. This is a case state publication called Making Compost, a Beginner's Guide. And the various slides and things that I have are taken from this publication. I start out with this one because they call this one the gold standard. If you've got the space, this is the thing you want. This is the Cadillac of composting materials. It is a three foot wide on each of these bins, three foot wide, three foot high. And, and so it's a three foot cubic, it's a cubic yard. And what you're able to do is you can start your compost in one, then there's another one. You can move your compost to another one, and then you can move the compost to a third one. You can have compost at three different phases of maturity and it's just a lovely way to be able to turn your compost. And we'll talk about what does it mean to turn your compost. On this one, you can see that there's wooden slats. These slats can actually be pulled out and removed so that you can get in there and do that removal of the compost and moving it to a new bend. Now, three foot, by three foot by three foot, that means this whole gold standard thing is, well, it's nine feet long. The, the con that I see on this one is it's so big <clears throat> that not everybody has nine foot to be able to um, you, you know, utilize just for composting. So that's the big drawback on this one is it's quite large. But man, it is a very effective way to do composting. So that's why it's considered the gold standard of compost bins. Here's some bins that are smaller and a little bit more flexible. This plastic bin is called a geo bin. Guess what? It's got a magic number. It's about three foot in diameter. Three foot is the, is the composting magic number because that gives you enough material to begin the decomposition process, but not so much that it, it uh, inhibits the oxygen from getting to the surface of in, into the composting pile. 
this plastic bin is very easy. You can fill it up when it's time to turn your compost. You can just yank it up, move it over to a new, new spot, and then turn your compost into that new area. This is maybe just an old snow fence that someone put together and they placed their compost. But again, it's about three feet in diameter. And so it's got that magic number. Um, the thing that you want to watch is you don't want the slats so far apart that they start to allow the material to fall out. This is, looks like a nice area. It lets, lets oxygen in, but it doesn't uh, let the material fall out. Now here's kind of just one third of that gold standard composting that we composter that we saw earlier. This is just one three foot by three foot area. And again, to make it easy to get into the compost, these boards are easily removable. So you take those out, you pull your compost out, turn it, and then you can reload your compost bin. This big thing over here, it's called the Big Black Earth Machine. That's actually the name of it. And it's what Sedgwick County gave away 20, 25 years ago. I don't remember. I have two of them. And I got them 20, 20, 25 years ago from the Sedgwick County Extension Service when they were really doing a push towards uh, increasing composting in Sedgwick County. It is wonderful. Now, after 25 years, mine has a few uh, zip ties and a little bit of wire and a little bit of duct tape here and there, but it's still pretty durable. Nice thing about this, the top comes off. So if you want to load your kitchen scraps in there, this lid just pops right off. And if you want to turn your compost, this door slides up. You can stick your shovel or your pitchfork in there, remove the material and put it back into the top. So it's really a wonderful uh, little tool. And if you want to totally move your compost, you can lift you can see these segments come apart. So the top part comes off. You can turn your compost pile into a new area and then the bottom comes off. Then you can rebuild it someplace. So I love my big black earth machine. It's, it's pretty wonderful. Some people like tumblers and I kind of gave you the big version and the little version of tumblers. This is a huge tumbler. It's an 88 gallon tumbler. And there's a door, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a door right here that flips open and you load your compost, you load your organic materials uh, into this bin. And then there's baffles that are in there. So when you roll this a handle, it, fluffs the materials that are in there and aerates them. So this is a, a, a great tool if you want to uh, really be sure that you're turning it or you want to actively involve. If you want to go out uh, you know, every night and turn your compost, you'll have compost in a couple of weeks. So it, it's a, a fun thing to do. It does need watering because you're putting so much air in that by turning it that you need to water your compost a little bit more frequently. Now think with me, this is 88 gallons. So that's a lot of material that could potentially go in there. It might be a little hard to turn the compost, uh, turn the composter uh, if, you, if you load it up clear full. So that might be a little bit big. Now, when I was looking, I found this 27 gallon and oh, it's just a pony. It's just an itty bitty one. Um, and it, they called it a table top composter. Now I get a little, a little bit of trouble if I brought that in and put it on my table. So I don't think everybody in the family would be happy if we had a table top composter. Uh, and 27 gallons, that may not be enough material to get hot enough and actually compost. So I think we, I'm kind of going to do a little Goldilocks thing here. 88 gallons may be too big and 27 gallons may be too little. There's probably a tumbler right here in the middle, maybe a 55 gallon tumbler that would be just right. But it really, these do aerate your compost 
your organic material very rapidly and it means that you're you're going to have finished compost much more quickly when you have a tumbler so those are the pros well here's the theme can we make it easier and cheaper well yeah pit why don't we just go out and dig a hole in somewhere in our backyard and then put our greens and our browns so when you're done with kitchen when you're done cooking you just take out your lettuce or watermelon rind or whatever happens to be there and then throw a little bit of soil on top of it and there you go now, this is not part of the K-State literature, but I think this was probably what the first humans found. They needed to put their, it wouldn't be kitchen waste because they didn't have a kitchen, but their leftover food scraps somewhere so that the bears or Tyrannosaurus rex didn't come and eat them. So they dug a hole, put a little bit of soil over the top. And then what they found was next year, Whatever the fruits were that the seeds were in there or the vegetables, they started growing out the top of this, this pit that they had. And to me, that was probably the first research project on composting, not supported by K-State literature, just supported by Mary's supposition. So you can go even bigger. You could do a big trench and throw your materials in there and then cover it up. This is called sheet composting. Well, this shows newspaper, but um, most people that I, that I talk to use cardboard and um, you wouldn't use green material on top of here. This would just be your brown. So you can see this is probably shredded uh, leaves or wood chips. And if you want to, to create a new raised bed, this is a great way to do it. Put your cardboard down put it over the top of your fescue and then put all that, the, those brown materials over there. You could probably include some grass clippings, but I wouldn't include any food products because that would just be asking for uh, some little rodents to come and munch down on that. And then next year, lo and behold, you'll actually have your raised bed. Now, I did this talk yes, uh, Tuesday evening, and somebody said, well, what if, can I do this over the top of my Bermuda? You know, you could try it, but the Bermuda is probably just going to be growing out the side. So I, I know it will smother and, and kill off weeds, and more than likely it'll kill off most fescue, fescue by doing it this way. But Bermuda is pesky, and it, it, it may not work that well for you if, it, if you've got Bermuda. Again, is there something easier? You know, do I even need to put down cardboard? You know, I call this the slow and the cold method of composting. It's what if you've ever just thrown your leaves in a pile and said to yourself in the fall, I'll get to them in the spring. And you just you never got to them. You never got them in the compost pile. You just didn't do anything. But when you stick your pitchfork in there or your shovel, that four or four to six inches on the bottom there is just this beautiful, uh, lush compost. It's finished. Now you still may have some leftover organic matter that, that didn't, didn't get decomposed, but those lower four inches, six inches, those earthworms and centipedes and, and all those little uh, ecosystem chewers they got in there and they started the decompo decomposition process. Now it may have not been hot and finished off and been perfect, but what's perfection? This is still just really good. This is a photo of one of our, one of our folks that are on tonight, Connie. This is Connie's garden from uh, a couple of years ago. She sent us this picture because this was just the perfect uh, composting spot. And I say perfect composting spot, you know, there's some things that are better and there are things that just downright don't work. Well, in this composting spot, the first thing is you want to have good drainage. Uh, if you don't have good drainage, you will be anaerobic. And just like we talked about 
in the landfill, when something becomes anaerobic, it will not decompose. So if you have a bunch of standing water, it will become anaerobic and your compost will not decompose. Uh, so good drainage is the first thing. Don't stick it in the lowest area of your backyard. Put it in a spot that's nice and level and has good drainage. You want a place with an adequate size. Now, Connie, Connie is a, a, an overachiever. Look at all the different methods that she has here. She doesn't have a nine by nine gold standard, but she's got, well, these are probably some geo bins. She's got a, 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 comp, a tumbler composter. She's got another geo bin back there. Wow, she's got multiple different methods that she can compost. You want easy access from your house because if you're bringing out your gardens, your kitchen scraps, you want to be able to take them and put them into your compost pile easily. You want easy access to water because compost needs, well, it needs greens and it needs browns, but it also needs air and water. So close enough to a water spigot so that you can keep it nice and moist. You want it near the garden for two reasons. First of all, you when you're trimming things in the garden, your tomato leaves, your, your uh, kale, your Swiss chard, whatever you're, you're trimming, you want to be able to place it in your compost easily. But conversely, once you've harvested your compost, and we'll talk about what it means to harvest. Once you've harvested your compost, you don't want to have to move it miles. You want to have easy access to take it to your garden. You want your tools easily available. Now, for me, if I go out to my compost pile and I'm, I'm taking out something, I'm taking out my kitchen scraps, if my hoe is right there or my pitchfork is right there, I might just go ahead and give it a little stir. Uh, here, Connie has a screen, and we'll talk about screening compost. Having your tools right there means you're ready to go, and there's no excuse, oh, I got to go get this and that. It's right there and ready, so you can turn your compost or harvest your compost with whatever time it is for you. Leaf Corral, this is a funny name. Many of us have created these things that we call our leaf corral. In the fall, you have all these leaves that come down off your tree, trees, and it's just too many to deal with in the fall. But in the summertime, you've got all these greens. You're mowing your grass. You've got the, the, uh, the waste from your, your uh, garden. You've got all these greens, but you don't have enough browns. If you create a leaf corral, a spot where you put your, your browns, your leaves, then all summer long, you'll be able to put your grass clippings in there and then mix some browns with them or put your kitchen scraps in and then cover them up with browns. A leaf corral is just the funnest thing to have. Um, it really keeps your compost very active all year round. Now, Connie went above and beyond. She found joy in composting. Look back here. She's even do decorated her compost bin. It's really quite the fun event. And to top it off, she placed this lovely grass in front of it. When you're in her backyard, you can't even see any of these compost items. It's just blocked by this lovely grass. If homeowners associations saw this, they would say, yes, everybody can have a compost bin as opposed to opposing them. Connie, good job. And thanks for sharing that picture with me. I've mentioned these greens, browns, water, and air. And if you look at the K-State guide that says the composting process, you'll see a little bit more information about each one of these. This is the not so secret recipe. It's only a four item recipe for composting. So here we go. Let's look at each one of these and see what is involved in them. Our compost recipe, well, first of all, 
we want to talk about smaller particles compost faster. Whether you're talking about a green or a brown, the smaller it is, the faster it composts. Again, it's just like us. We start chewing our food and the smaller it is, the easier it is for our body to digest it. Browns. Browns are materials that are rich in carbon. Carbon is a natural source. It's an organic material. Well, what things have carbon in them? Well, you heard about my leaf corral. So leaves are one of our biggest sources of carbon. Straw is a great source of carbon. Shredded paper. To me, there's nothing more uh, secure than taking your shredded paper out to your compost bin and having the worms eat it. No one will ever know what was written on your financial statements once they're shredded and eaten by uh, uh, worms. Now, we said smaller is better. So cardboard, if you do use cardboard, you're going to have to tear it up. I find it a little bit difficult to tear up cardboard. So you don't want to put an actual layer of cardboard. Uh, you would want to tear it up. K-State talks about sawdust and pine needles, but what I'm going to say is I put pine needles in my compost pile three years ago, and I have pine, post, pine needles in my compost pile today. P pine needles really do not decompose very rapidly, but they're a lovely um, material that um, gives space and, and lets, uh, lets a little bit more air in. Um, so they don't degrade very readily and neither does sawdust, but leaves, straw, shredded paper, those degrade very rapidly. Okay, greens. Greens are materials that are high in nitrogen, rich in nitrogen. So those would be the food scraps. The When you're cooking dinner tonight and the ends off the asparagus, or if you had a melon, the rind off the melon, or those last little bits of lettuce that are just looking really nasty. Those food scraps are great sources, great sources of green. Now, even things like uh, bread products, um, those, those are great things to put in on, for your greens. In the summertime, Grass clippings are a wonderful source of greens. Now, I want to say grass clippings without pesticides. If you use a lawn service that does any, any type of pesticide, you need to allow three to four mowings, three to four weeks before utilizing those. But I say be organic. Don't use pesticides. And then you can use your grass clippings all year long. Some manures are good. Eggshells are wonderful. Not only do they add a, a a nitrogen component, but they also add a calcium component. And then coffee grounds. Now that sounds weird because coffee grounds look brown to me. Why would they be in the green section? They're in the green section because they're higher in nitrogen uh, than other things. So uh, I go to my local uh, coffee place and I get my coffee grounds. And in the winter time, I throw in coffee grounds with my leaves and my compost pile goes very nicely all year around. I wanted to show a, a photo of just a few other uh, um, greens and browns. Um, and eggshells can be on either side. So don't, don't worry about them being over here on the brown side. I put this reference into the uh, chat box. Uh, some folks at my talk Tuesday wanted a little bit more information on what, what is considered a green and a brown. Uh, so this uh, grid shows you a little bit more in depth of what is green, what is considered a green and a brown. Even your little tea bags, uh, it's good, it's okay, even with the string and the little tag, stick those in. I, I like to test it out, see, see what might compost and what might not compost. All right, so we have got greens and we've got browns. And now the recipe says we need to add water and we need to add air. And you always want to add enough water to keep your compost, to keep your organic material moist. Now, all the literature says 
that the material should be moist like a like a, like a sponge like a moist sponge and to me i just don't know what a moist sponge looks like so what i say is if you take your gloved hand and i i always wear gloves when i'm doing my compost because there's we saw all those those organisms if you take your compost and you squeeze it water does not drip out of it but it feels nice and moist so it's moist but not soaked and then we need to add air. So we add air by turning our compost. So you can see here, this was a compost pile and there's the material. And they've done something that's really an advanced technique. They've taken a tarp, placed it down on the ground and then they get their pitchfork and they remove the compost, remove the organic material, put it into the pile, fluff it up now there's a lot of brown in here. I might add some grass clippings or I might add some coffee grounds because that there's really a lot of brown in there. And now that you're adding the air and the water, some greens would really help this to become a very active compost pile. Well, how much green and how much brown should I put into my compost pile? The magic number is anywhere from two to five parts brown to one part green. Now think back to that video where I showed you the 15 weeks of decomposition of the browns. You can never have too much browns, but if you had only greens, it would be nasty. You always have to have more greens, more carbon than you do nitrogen. If you just have nitrogen, it becomes very um, sour and anaerobic, and it really is not a pleasant experience. So always having at least two parts brown to, two, to one part green. Now, Mary, how do I figure out how many parts of brown and how many parts of green I'm doing? Well, what I do is I've got a five gallon bucket and I throw a five gallon bucket of leaves into my compost pile. And then I throw in a half, a ga half of that five gallon bucket with greens. I mix it up and then I just keep repeating. So I know I've got a two to one mixture of browns carbon to greens, nitrogen. Now, some people like to layer it. I find that if I layer it, sometimes I'll get like a, a, a whole layer of leaves that almost become impenetrable to moisture. Or, and we know if you have a really thick layer of grass, it becomes green and it, it just becomes slimy and anaerobic. So I do what I call, I call this the blender method of composting. You don't find that in K-State literature. Again, this is a Maryism. Uh, by putting the greens and the browns and then just mixing them together with my pitchfork, um, it begins to look more like confetti. So you see a little bit of brown and a little bit of green and a little bit of coffee grounds and a little bit of shredded paper and all those come together to make a really active compost bin. Well, is there an easier way than breaking your back and taking your pitchfork and turning it all over on the tarp. One of my compost buddies brought this to our meeting. It's called a compost turner. Magical number, it's about how big? It's about three foot long because our compost piles are three foot by three foot. And this is like a gigantic corkscrew. So you take it and you turn it into your compost pile and it goes down and then you pull it back up and then you just do that repeatedly uh, on your comp on your pile she got this for christmas and i'm going to tell you this is on my list of what i want for christmas next year a compost turner because doesn't that look a lot easier than taking your pitchfork and turning everything out and turning it over i'm going to give it a try for christmas it's on my list if you're listening 
Well, this is another one of our um, compost uh, committee members. This is Kathy. And Kathy sent this picture because this is a magical event that composters really love. This is a winter day. The temperature outside is in the 30s. But look at what is coming out of this vent that Kathy has down in the middle of her compost pile. She put that vent down there to try and assist with more airflow. There, it's just a normal PVC pipe. It's kind of big. It's probably a six inch in diameter PVC pipe. She drilled holes in it and it goes down into her compost pile and it vents the compost. It lets air come out. And what do you see at the top? This beautiful steam coming out. So her compost is very hot. It is cooking. That's what we talk about is when your compost gets warm, all those bacteria get active and, and it becomes it becomes this oxidation process and it, it generates heat and you have little microbes that are thermophils and they make the compost nice and hot and different bacteria and fungus are active in different times. This is really a great cooking compost. It's not all wonderful in composting sometimes there's trouble so i gave you uh, the link to the troubleshooting guide well i rarely have a rotten odor in my compost because i keep it nice and moist but not too wet i turn it regularly so it's got a lot of oxygen and i don't put thick layers of green like a bunch of grass if you have a rotten odor then that's excess moisture. It's turned into an anaerobic, so without oxygen, or maybe it's compacted like that landfill we saw. And then it gives you the solution, turning your compost or maybe using that compost uh, corkscrew and getting, them, getting more air in there and adding uh, dry material, some browns. So that troubleshooting guide is there for you to look at and to know that uh, there are solutions if you have some issues with uh, your, your composting. Well, I couldn't live without my compost thermometer. Really, I got it for Christmas a couple years ago. It's the truth. So next year I get a, I get a compost corkscrew. A couple years ago, I had my compost thermometer. You only know your compost is getting hot if you measure the temperature. So uh, in a good compost pile that's three foot by three foot, that magic number, temperatures can get into the 130 to 150 range. That's a great range because um, weed seeds, well, even other seeds, because you're putting all your vegetable clippings in there, um, your strawberry seeds, your tomato seeds, I get some of my best uh, volunteer tomatoes out of my compost pile because not always does it get up hot enough to kill off all the seeds. But 130 to 150 is a really wonderfully hot compost. When the temperature goes up, then gradually it will fall back down until it's back to the ambient temperature. Then you turn your compost and I like to add some greens because that's time to get it heating up again. And for me, those greens are very often coffee grounds, or if it's the summertime, it's my uh, grass clippings that uh, haven't had any pesticides on them. And then guess what? It heats back up and then it goes back to the amb ambient temperature. This may occur three or four times and the thing that you'll notice each time is that compost pile, it may start three feet tall, but it shrinks. And by the time you get ready to harvest it, it's probably maybe half the size of what you started with. It really, you can see that whole decomposition process. All those bioengineers have eaten their fill and, and um, taken it down to smaller particles. So once the temperature stays at that ambient temperature range and you look at it, are there still big chunks of leaves or is it this dark, fluffy, transformed material that is now humus or compost? If, it, if it's all transformed or most of it's transformed, then it's time to harvest. 
Now, this picture over here was taken on uh, February 13th. The temperature outside was 37 degrees and my compost pile was heated up about 135, 136 degrees. So you can really see the ambient temperature doesn't matter. Your compost heats up because of that, that um, oxidation, the decomposition process and all the little microbes that are working on your, your material. Okay, harvesting compost. So it's gone up, it's gone down, it's gotten smaller, and now it's just staying at the ambient temperature. It's time to harvest the compost. Well, I showed you that screen that Connie had. Those screens are just, it's just really screen material put over a frame. So it's got that half inch uh, hole on the screen material, wire screen. And what you do is you put that screen over the top of your wheelbarrow or your um, bin or whatever you're wanting to put your compost into your bucket. And then you either shake your compost or with your gloved hand. Some people like to use like a wooden block and use that to rub over it. It's kind of like a cheese grater. You're just grating that through to, and it falls down into your bucket. Screening is a, a way to give you this beautiful, nice, uniform compost. It looks great. It looks finished. But I tell you, it's a lot of work. I screened my compost oh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was about 45 degrees outside. And I was sweating. You know, it, it's a lot of work to dig it up and throw it in there. So again, we're going to ask, is there a way to do it that's easier? Well, yeah. Why don't you just use it? Don't screen it. Just put the shovels in your wheelbarrow and take it over and use it. It's a little bit rougher, but it's eventually going to decompose. So just use it. You might not want to use it on your uh, in your flower in your excuse me in your vegetable garden because it, if you're putting in seeds, it might be a little rough for that. You might want screened compost there. Or maybe you just go ahead and do it. So um, it's a much easier way than screening. It's really amazing to me to take kitchen scraps, leaves, uh, grass clippings, coffee grounds, eggshells, and in weeks, sometimes months, you have this magnificent product this humus, this dark, fluffy, earthy smelling material that is just so great on your, um, in, for, your, for your soil. You're really feeding your soil. You're feeding your soil. All the different things that you put in are now going into your soil. But we're gonna ask, isn't there some easier way? Can't we make it simpler? And if we did make it simpler, wouldn't more people do this? Well, we talked about grass clippings. I love my grass clippings. But isn't there an easier way? You mow your grass. Well, probably you fertilize your grass. You fertilize your grass. You mow your grass. You bag your grass clippings. You have to take your grass clippings back to your compost pile. And then you remember that Mary said, don't put the whole bag of grass clippings on because it'll become this gunky, gunky, green, slimy mess. So then you have to shovel them around with some browns. My, isn't that a lot of work? Well, here, let's see if there's something easier. Why don't you just mulch mow? Rather than putting that compost on your lawn to make it grow better, why don't you just mulch mow? And as long as your grass isn't 10 inches tall, you've not been on vacation. If you're mulch mowing regularly, it's not going to cause a problem. Now, I hear people get worried about thatch. This is not your dad's Bermuda grass. Most of us today have created lawns of fescue. And fescue has these lovely little fine slivers. And once you cut them, if you're cutting it at fairly reasonable length, they fall down and they degrade lovely into the soil. And they will feed your grass without you having to walk them back, 
put them in the compost pile and then spread them on your grass when they're fully finished compost. Well, <clears throat> are there more ways that are easy? I, I say yes. This, this is what I am doing. I am creating a butterfly island. This is from Dick Arboretum. They just, they sent this out a, a couple of months ago and their big sale of native plants is coming up this uh, in a couple of weeks. And I bought almost every one of these plants in their butterfly island. Native plants, milkweed, coreopsis, uh, verbena, all these different native plants. What I've done is I had a flower bed and I'm just adding on two additional feet to that flower bed that's about 25 feet long. So by adding two additional feet on that 25 foot long, I'm putting 50 more feet into native um, beds. And additionally, what I'm doing is removing 50 feet from my lawn, 50 feet of fescue grass that's fastidious. It wants to be fertilized. It wants to be watered. It wants to be taken care of. I'm tired of running an intensive care unit for my fescue. I'm putting in natives that are nearly as, as fastidious as fescue is, and that's going to really assist um, in diminishing the inputs that I have into my lawn. Not only do you help the butterflies, Think about this, all those pollinators, the bees, the, the caterpillars, all those different animals, those insects, those critters now have a place to reside. You're really helping nature out by increasing your uh, native plantings, or even if you choose not to do natives, any kind of a flower garden, zinnias or any of those things. All right, leaves. Well, we said we love leaves. We have a, I have a leaf corral. I love to, to mulch mow my leaves and put them in my corral. But look at this. You have to rake them up. You have to bag them. You have to mulch mow them. You have to take them back to your compost. You have to put them in a leaf corral. Well, isn't there an easier way? Why don't you leave the leaves? This is a new saying that, that people that really are pro-pollinators and finding ways that our pollinators can live uh, in our environment is to leave the leaves. When you think about a tree, they drop their leaves and they kind of drop it around their base. I like to think of this as the tree blanket for the winter. They put those leaves down there because well, they suck the nutrients up out of the soil to make those leaves. Now what they want to do is to return those leaves to the soil so that next year they can utilize those nutrients back up and continue that whole cycle of, of nutrients. Well, in my, in my neighborhood, I have a 20 three deciduous trees in my in my yard it, yeah if if I left the leaves I would not be able to get in my driveway or to open my front door so, so I I mulch mow my leaves and then I take them back to my compost pile but I have found areas where I can leave some of those leaves behind my shrubs, around my trees, uh, by the, the side of my house. The Homeowners Association would never know that I leave my leaves because I do it in such a lovely fashion. So think about it. Is there a way that you can leave the leaves in some areas or you can mulch mow some of the leaves into your lawn? But then if you really do want to remove your leaves, well, don't send them to the landfill. There are companies that will, for free of charge, if you take them out there in biodegradable bags, they will compost your leaves for them. And there are services that will actually come to your house and for a fee, 
remove these, uh, remove the bagged leaves and then take them to their composting services. I actually found one of the um, organic farms here in Wichita and I took bags of my leaves out because um, one year I attempted to keep all my leaves. I had the motto, no leaf left behind. I didn't want to get rid of any leaves, but I was so overwhelmed with my 23 trees that I had leaf corrals everywhere and I couldn't do that again the next year. I, I was still using the leaves for a couple of years. So by partnering with this um, organic farm, I took my bags of leaves out there and then she had a gigantic compost pile. So look for ways that you don't send this wonderful resource, this gold to the landfill because it will become anaerobic and it will not decompose. Okay, kitchen scraps. Is there an easier way? You know, do you wanna walk out there every night and put your kitchen scraps in your compost pile? I don't. So I have a compost crock. Underneath my sink, I have a little bucket. It looks a lot like this. And I put my kitchen scraps in there. Uh, and I even put in bread and uh, wildest thing I put in there, I put in, uh, I had some leftover yeast. Whatever is organic, I put in there. And then once a week or whenever it's full, I take it out to my bigger compost pile. On the blue crock over here, you can see this even has a biodegradable liner. So this person just has to take the, take the liner out, take it to their uh, compost pile, stick it in. Uh, I always wanna cover my kitchen scraps with a little bit of brown so that no little rodents or things want to go visit and have, have a meal of what I've left. Now for me, I don't have a liner. I just take it to the spigot, rinse it out and throw that extra water back into my compost pile. So it keeps my compost pile nice and moist. You know, I did a lot of research when I was doing this talk and this popped up one day, it was called indoor composting. You know, it's a lot like that. Uh, do you really want to have the um, tumbler on your kitchen table? Indoor composting, it's a Japanese method and uh, it uh, has a special blend that you're, you put in there. You put your kitchen scraps in there and then you put in a blend of microorganisms, bran and molasses, and then it ferments the food all right there in your kitchen. And then this was the part that I said, it's not gonna be in my kitchen. Um, you drain the liquid via the spigot. It, it could maybe be in my garage, but it couldn't be in my, and I don't know that I can drain anything via a spigot. But then no matter what, you have to take the rest of it to your compost pile, or I guess you can put it into your garden soil. So. It was an interesting method, but um, not probably for me. And then again, things just started popping up uh, when I was doing my research. This is called the Lomi machine. This is an electric composting machine. Go figure, an electric composting machine. You put your kitchen scraps in there, you put the lid on it, you push the button and magically the, the literature never said how long it took, but there you go. And that looks a lot like finished compost. It's really lovely, dark humus. So who knows, may, may actually work. This is what I did as a kid uh, in the evenings. My mom would give me the leftover kitchen scraps and I would take them down to the basement, take the lid off of our worm bin. I would throw the kitchen scraps in one end. I'd put a little bit of paper over the top and then I would spurt it with the, um, the, the water. This was a great way to um, create worm castings. So it's not really compost, but it's a fun way to dispose of your kitchen uh, materials. And worm castings are just a great soil amendment. And this is called vermiculture. I didn't include any resources on that, but if you wanna look at it, just, uh, just Google vermiculture and you'll get lots of information on it. Well, speaking of Googling, I wanted to see, are there other services? 
what could we do? So this is a list of every service that was available in Wichita for fee for composting. So somebody will do your composting for you. Can you get any easier than that? Somebody's going to do your composting. So there were two different services, Nudge and ICT, Compost ICT, uh, that pick up food scraps from homes or businesses. Um, and uh, Compost ICT said that they would even, uh, if you scheduled it with them, they would, they would do uh, yard waste as well. Nudge gave information to me about they, they now partner with apartment buildings and offices to do their composting. They recently started with Wichita State to, to do their food recycling. They estimate nearly 350 pounds of material has been prevented from going to the landfill. Wow, that's material that was not only didn't go to the landfill, but was also converted into beautiful compost. They sell their compost and they also donate their compost. They, they donate their compost to uh, some of our community gardens and our school gardens. So uh, what a great service that's available if you're not able or not in an area where you could personally compost. Compost ICT was recently taken over by Serenity Farms, and they give you some really clear information. They're going to give you a five-gallon bucket. They're going to tell you what to put in there. Once a week, they're going to come swap it out with a clean bucket, and lo and behold, there you go. Now, when you look at their logo, they have some things in there that are, are not listed on our K-State publications. Um, there's a, a fish bone in there. Some cultures... Uh, utilize fish bones in their composting. It's just not something that we see in the literature that I've provided to you. So you just need to know um, what, what you want to compost and what you don't want to compost. But once you get compost, what am I supposed to do with it? Well, like I said, you can spread it over your lawn or you could just mulch mow. You could put shovels on your, on your shrubs or you know around the bottom base of your tree. You could mix it in your pots. Now, I would suggest that you only mix it in pots that are outdoors because sometimes <clears throat> compost has some gnats <clears throat> uh, and some things in it that maybe you wouldn't want in an indoor pot. In the spring, put on two to four inches in your, in your garden and you will have just the most magnificent vegetables. It's absolutely uh, a wonder. But I'm going to ask, is there an easier way? Do I want to put compost on my garden? Well, I threw this in there because this is this is the, a, a new uh, way of really decreasing the work that you have in your garden. Um, I still put compost onto my onto my raised bed gardens, but I also cover areas with uh, straw. And in essence, what you're doing is creating a layer, a barrier that prevents weeds. And it also enhances uh, moisture retention. Uh, and then it nourishes. It gradually breaks down and decomposes into the soil. So it's a great way to add nutrients and retain moisture for your soil. And you don't have to work so hard. So why did we want to, to why did we want to compost? To me, it's a magic transformation. You know, we call these things waste. We call it garden waste or kitchen waste, but it's not waste. These are very valuable materials, and we're going to prevent them from going into the landfill. Uh, it turns it into just a magical uh, amendment for our soil. It invigorates our soil. It puts more organic material there. And as we've seen in some of that research, there are more beneficial life forms, more organisms that are going to help the root system of the plant. And it's also just a wonder to watch nature's recycling program in action. So tonight we've learned that compost is both a verb and a noun. So the verb is the action, or us helping nature degrade those browns and greens into the product that we call compost or humus. It's that dark, rich uh, material. We want to do it because it enriches our soil. It helps hold moisture. And it's going to diminish the waste stream into our landfills. We want to 
we want to make compost using that recipe more browns than greens more more air than water we don't want it to be too wet we don't want it to become anaerobic we use compost in our garden on our lawn in our pots but it's also important to look for easier ways maybe we want to mulch mow maybe we want to convert some of our lawn to pollinator gardens find some spots that you can leave the leaves and think about incorporating no-till those are easier ways we still love our compost but if there's something that's easier let's give it a try these are the resources that uh, i've listed for you and this is the one uh, that I didn't have on your handouts that we've put into the chat box. Uh, if you need help, we have a garden hotline that's available Monday through Friday uh, from nine in the morning until uh, four in the afternoon. You can call, you can email pictures. So at this email address, if you've got something going on, if you're wanting to know what's happening with your plant, or if you find this really cool insect, send us a picture, send us a couple of pictures and we'll help you out with that. We're always interested in what, what you're needing. K-State is an equal opportunity provider and employee, and we're just happy to be partnering with the, the library to do outreach. So compost happens and we can help. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to some questions. So I'm gonna stop my share and see your smiling faces. You know, I, I did this talk on Tuesday, Sarah, and um, one of the first questions that people asked was, you know, you, you said that the things that we can put in, um, but you didn't say the things that we can't put in. So I just wanted to mention some of the stuff that maybe we want to avoid putting in. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, bones, fish bones. The majority of um, composters don't put bones into their, you don't want to put, you definitely want to, don't want to put meat. You don't want to put meat. You don't want to put dairy products. Um, now, I am one that likes to try. So I like to stretch that list. So um, I was at a coffee shop getting my coffee grounds uh, with one of my nieces and she got one of those mocha frosty coffee drinks. And she said, don't worry, Mary, it says it's compostable. The cup said it was compostable. So I put it in my compost pile. For three years, I turned it in my compost pile. And on the third year, I got it out and I read, and it really it really did say compost, and it looked just like the day I put it in. I swear, I could have taken it back to the coffee shop and had them fill it up, and it, it, they would have thought it was a fresh, clean glass after they washed it. It said industrially compostable. So you gotta be really clear in when you're looking at stuff, because when it says industrial compostable, it's gotta be chopped up by this big machine and then it, it then supposedly it'll compost. Now I got a flip side to that. I went to a local pizza place and uh, for a long time, they just had plastic to put your to-go stuff in. And so I would always get the gigantic cardboard box and I was only putting in one piece of pizza. And finally one night I went there and I said, do, uh, you know, do you have, comp you know, I, I need a to-go box. And she brought me this beautiful little uh, bo cardboard box. And on the top of it, it said, it said compostable in 90 days. Now you've thrown the gauntlet down for me, 90 days. I put it in my compost pile and I had to go back to them. And I said to them, no, you are wrong. It did not compost in 90 days. In less than 30 days, I couldn't even find it. It was truly a compostable material. I like to do those kinds of things. It's also a fun thing to do with your, your kids or your grandkids. So take a straw. If the straw says that it's compostable, put a string through it and put it in your compost pile and then look at it and watch. I did that, of course, and guess what happened? The string composted before the straw did. I still have the straw, but the string's gone, so I, I don't know. So Sarah, what other questions do we have? 
Who's oh, Sarah? I can't hear you. A one second for Sarah. Well, I'll, I'll do another question that I got last Tuesday. They asked about manures. I said some manures are okay to use. If the if the animal eats meats, um, no, can't use it no matter what. So no dog or cat manure. Um, they The meat eating adds some microbes that are pathogenic to humans and you would not wanna use it on your um, vegetables. Uh, so herbivores, cows, rabbits, chickens, those kinds of things. But you, you, it can get really hot. Manures have got a lot of nitrogen in them. So you got to balance that with a lot of browns. Um, let's see. All right. So I can read now. Someone well, asked. Let's see. Is my microphone working again? Now, now it is, Sarah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's have a conversation. I don't know why I was getting that message. But um, anyway, we had a question about big black earth machines. Are they still available? Um, they, this person loved it over the years. High winds blew off the top and would like to get some replacement parts. I don't know if you can buy them, but, but. We're having the Master Gardener Spring Fling Sale. And uh, two or three years ago, several people brought their, their big black earth machines. So on the very first day of the Master Gardener Spring Fling Sale, um, it's May, look at our website, look at our website. It's in, sometime in May, um, go there because if you're ever gonna find one, it's gonna be there. So I don't know if they're available commercially anymore. I'm gonna look it up while we go on to the next question. Um, I think you kind of talked about this. Somebody asked about watering being required, but you talked about it being moist, but not wet. Right. And that's really a hard thing to think about. Um, if, it's, if it's gonna drip water, that means that it's soaked and then you're anaerobic. Um, and we know that the four components, browns, greens, water, you have to have air. And if it's too wet, it's anaerobic and it's not going to work. It's going to just become putrid kind of, you know, mm. sour. And that does not seem like a fun thing to have. No, it's not. It or smells. turn and move around. Um, how do you keep the greens until you have the two and a half gallons of it to add to your larger compost? Well, I go, I go to my local coffee place and I get bags of their coffee and I just sit it around. It's really funny because a couple of my friends now bring me their coffee grounds regularly. They don't compost, so they want to do something for the earth and they bring their coffee grounds to me. And I know I focus on coffee grounds, um, but uh, grass clippings, what I do is when I mow my yard, I take my grass clippings back and I just throw them in and I mix them into my browns. So you gotta be ready when the greens are there. And similarly, if you don't have enough of the browns, that's why I have my leaf corral. So, so there's always a little bit of brown and then when the greens are there, I got it. Um, we got a recommendation on the nudge compost um, and that they'll come pick it up for you. So that's great. Um, love no until gardening. Uh, now you talked about fish bones. Uh, oh, and you said the manure, but you can't put meat scraps in the compost bin. And why now, not? That's where you start to have problems with rodents. Um, I don't want to open my compost bin and find um, a mouse or worse, a rat. And I've, I've never, and I, I've composted my entire life and never, ever had any of those uh, problems. Uh, and when you start to put meat scraps in there, that's what it will attract. So yeah, varmints are not something that you want. That's fair. Um, and does your compost pile need sun or shade? You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, if, if you are in the sun, then you're gonna need to water it more frequently because uh, you'll have a, a, a more evaporation. But the compost pile that you saw that of mine that was 137 degrees, uh, it's in the shade. And here it was cold outside and in the shade, hmm. but my compost pile was 137 degrees. Wow, that's warm. Yeah, yeah. That picture with the steam coming off, kind of mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. Um, 
and it's just doing it on its own, which is cool. Well, there's lots of helpers in there. There's lots of little microbes and the pile little, on its own, maybe. That's right. Yeah, yeah. There's as a, lots as of a micro, uh, I don't know what you even call that. It's anyway, like a, it's a it's the Earth's microbiome again. Analogy of us chewing it up. Yeah saliva degrading it and then it gets into our gut and we know there's all those microorganisms in our gut and we've learned now that our gut microbiome is really important to us and similarly same thing for our compost pile our compost our compost pile microbiome microbiome i love that uh okay how can chickens help with composting well, <laughs> well chicken manure is is a very hot manure so th that's mm. good um, folks that, that have chickens often put a straw down for the chickens to either bed in and then, or feed upon, you know, go around. And when the chickens jump, they smash up the straw, but additionally they poop. So chicken manure. So you got the green, you got the chicken manure, you got the brown, you got the straw. That's almost like an automatic composter right there you just shovel it into a pile and you you've got some active material there wow and then you can use the eggshells oh good point yeah um and now if you don't turn the pile will it still compost uh, yes it will now hopefully you've got it mixed up well you we saw that one where i said <clears throat> If you don't want to dig a hole, if you don't want to use a compost bin, if you just want to do quote unquote cold composting, uh, not have it get to 130 degrees, if you just want to throw everything in a big pile, eventually it will degrade. Now, it might take a year, it might take two years, but it will eventually degrade. Yeah. Um, we've got. Uh, somebody sharing some links in the um, in the chat, so feel free to check those out. Uh, if you have a compost drum, does it help to paint it black to, I guess, collect more of the sunlight? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, whatever color is fine. I have a green one, I have a black one. I've got a chicken wire one. Um, I don't have any other colors. Uh, the color, really, it's it's innate within the the composting process the heat that's generated uh and just because the big black earth machine is black is not why it gets nice and hot it's it's black it, and the normal activities even if it was white the same activities would be occurring within it and um it's an oxidation process it's a, a degradation process and that's where the heat is uh, generated from interesting um, here's a tip from somebody in our audience. They use those big salad containers to store scraps. And then when um, they recycle it, when they're done with it or when they get new salad. So wow, you don't want to get a whole bucket to put on your counter. I use, those salad, I use those salad containers to start my seeds in. It's like a little mm. terrarium. Another good tip. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I did get to the end of our question. So if you've been waiting to submit one, feel free to do that now. I'm going to go back through and make sure I didn't forget anything. Or if I did put it back in the chat. Um, and if you didn't get the, um, just to, as a point of clarification for everyone, I did send those links um, to the handouts that Mary's been talking about um, from my personal email. So it didn't come from our normal admin um, because honestly, I forgot to include them, but I did send them after the fact so that you could have them. And then there's another one in uh, the chat box that links to the additional resources that Mary shared after Tuesday's talk. Um, in the Tumblr, I'm thinking it's harder to get all the organisms needed such as centipedes and millipedes into them. That's a good thought. Um, how do you introduce like the earthworms and stuff if you have one that's off the ground? Oh, so into the tumbler? Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of folks like to throw in um, a couple shovel shovels full of soil or um, if you've got another, 
many people have more than one method of composting. So take the compost from one and it's almost like an inoculation process. Um, tumblers really do rely more on that active aeration. Um, when you get into industrial composting, you know, like we saw that little loamy machine, there are no earthworms in that loamy machine. Now there are, there are some microbes uh, just off of the kitchen scraps, but um, industrial composting really relies more on a mechanical and um, aeration process. That's kind of what the tumbler is doing. It's more mechanical and aeration. So it's doing an oxidation and you don't have those, those ecosystem chewers as much. But throwing a shovel full of soil in there, that'd be a great way. If you got some of your worms, um, throw those in there. It, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt. Good question. Um, if you are starting a new compost pile, is it a good idea to add a little bit of the already made compost? You know, um, you don't have to. Uh, you don't need to go buy a, a, a bag of compost. And I often see things like compost accelerators that are advertised all over the place. And I think it's just an expensive way to add something to your compost pile. It's going to happen. You saw it on my slide. Compost happens. We don't have to throw in, you know, a bag of really expensive special blend fermenting sauce. It's going to happen. So uh, a shovel full of soil has a lot of microbes in it already. So let's let's just let it save our money and do it the easier way. I think no one's going to argue with you on that. Um... We've got some really nice comments for you. Great class, learned a lot. Best presentation ever. Um, so I'll make sure you get to see those. If you're not seeing them already, roll in. Um, the best lecture I've ever heard on the subject. <laughs> so there you go. You've made compost interesting. <laughs> okay, so I, I do have to tell a story because I'm the chair of the compost committee and um, our one of our other previous chairs started calling us compost enthusiasts. And you know, that's such a kind word because so often in our families, in our work settings, we're called compost weirdos because it's not everybody that wants to go out and take a thermometer or take a corkscrew and do the corkscrew on their compost. And I'm so happy when I get a group of, of people that are interested in helping nature do these things and revitalizing our soil, helping soil health, helping our plants. You know, it's, it's wonderful to have a group of enthusiasts. So I now dub you all compost enthusiasts. You're not compost cr crazies, you're compost <laughs> enthusiasts. Sounds much better. Yes. Um, I'm going to toss the um, evaluation into our chat box as well. That is um, that really helps us when we're developing new programs. Um, if you have any gardening topics you want to cover. Also, we just really like to know how we're doing. So fill that out for us. We appreciate it. Um, and last call for questions, I guess. Let's see what we can get there. Um, and then if you haven't already, you, I'll, I'll do a plug for next week. We're going to have uh, plants that love our Kansas sun. Oh, and um, Mary, you had asked about the spring sale at the Master Gardener. The spring garden fair is scheduled for May 7th. Yay, thank you. Yes. Uh, cherry tomato plant giveaway will be included as well as a silent auction. Um, and to the, um, Linda, the, the link to the evaluation just takes a really long time to load. Um, so just give it a moment. It will eventually get there. And um, I, see our, I see our next generation of composters. I love it. It's never, it's never too early to teach composting. As I, I, as I said, my job was to take the, com, take the kitchen scraps down to the worms and feed the worms every night. So that's, that's the next job. Uh, I remember having to turn hours. I had to argue with my dad about whether or not that was really necessary. Now I can tell them it's not, it just takes longer. There you go. <laughs> um, and then one last question, are the Master Gardeners back at the Extension Office now? 
Absolutely, the hotline is staffed, staffed fully. We're uh, and, and as as we said, we've got our garden fair coming up on that May fifth through seventh date. Um, we're there having a great time engaging with the the public. So yes, come on out. Awesome. Okay. Well, you know, um, let's just go ahead and we'll let you all get back to your evenings. Thank you so much for joining us for this fascinating look into uh, compost. And thank you to Mary for sharing your insights and wide knowledge with us this evening.